Welcome to the first day of the rest of your lives. My name is Andy Zaremba, and with me behind the helm today, as usual, is my brother Mike. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you, and uh, really happy to be back and doing another awesome podcast on a beautiful Monday night in the fall of Vancouver. Absolutely. And uh, for those of you that know us, we are recording out of 70 West Gold River Street here at Float House in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And if you have no idea what Float House is, Float House is a, uh, a center that holds sensory deprivation or flotation tanks. And uh, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about what floating has to offer, you can visit our website, floathouse.ca. Or if you're not from Vancouver and you'd like to find a float center near you, you can check out flo- floatationlocations.com. And there are uh, pretty much float centers in every major city across North America at definitely. this point. Yep. And uh, it definitely is relevant to our guests today. And I'd also like to give a quick mention and shout out to Tony Flo Real. Yes. <laughs> we bumped into him on some online communities. In fact, it was the London Real uh, Academy a few years ago. I first started interacting with him online and he hit us up and introduced us to our guest today. So um, our guest, we're very, really happy to have uh, Jamie Wheel. He is the executive director of the Flo-, Flo Genome Project and a leading expert in neurophysiology and human performance. He's the co-author of the book Stealing Fire, How Silicon Valley Naval Seals, Navy Seals and Maverick Scientists Are All Revolutionizing How We Live and Work. It was a Pulitzer Prize winning nominee book. Um, so I want to just dive into it right now. Jamie, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks guys. So you were in town for the Spirit Plants Medicine Conference, and uh, how did that? How does how is that whole conference perceived by you? How did you enjoy it? Well, it was interesting. I mean, I, I said yes to come because uh, Wade Davis and Dennis McKenna. Yes, um, yes, those stellar, yeah. a couple and legends there. Yeah, Wade is one of my all-time heroes. Um, and for those that don't know him, he's um, he's a Harvard-trained ethnobotanist. He studied under Richard Evan Schultes, who was kind of the original model for Indiana Jones, the kind of swashbuckling botanist yes. who would go down to the Amazon in the 30s and, 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 you know, gallivant around with first contact tribes. Ended up working for the CIA, basically, the, or the OSS in, in, uh, in during World War II, securing, like, strategic rubber supplies, first contact with ayahuasca, et cetera, and, and Wade was his protege. Mm-hmm. And for anybody that's seen The Serpent and the Rainbow, that movie about Haitian voodoo, Wade was the one who went down and found the basically the sort of the narcoleptic potions that allowed them to create zombies. Uh, and then he also proceeded, you know, went deep into, into Colombia and everywhere else. And uh, my all-time favorite TED Talk is his from 2007, uh, which is the where he talks about the ethnosphere and how mm-hmm. we're paying attention to the loss of the ecosphere, but what we should also be really be watching and, 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 you know, protecting is the loss of human culture. Mm. And it's one of the more profound talks. It's him completely off the cuff. Uh, and, wow. I got, and I got to spend a couple of, you know, just an hour with him in the green room. And he was in f- fine form. We jumped straight <laughs> into telling stories about the Colombian cartels and gallivanting through Colombia and children fishing with, you know, kites made of plastic bags from the rivers and how he's now saving the, the Magdalena River mm. in Colombia and, you know, flying on the helicopter with, the, with the, the president of the country. And like, you're like, oh, this guy is still killing it. Nice. So, yeah, that was my reason for coming. I, I, I wanted to spend time uh, in, in the company of those guys. Very cool. Uh, absolutely. And uh, what did you make of the, the conference as a whole? Do you think they're doing a, a good job in representing the, maybe you can call it the psychedelic renaissance that we find ourselves in these days? Yeah, well, it was interesting because um, on first glance, I came in, I'm like, oh, hey, now, this is a woolly ass thing, right? Woo woo there? Yeah, yeah, lots, lots of it. And, and lots, of, lots of crunchy, you know, like forest people. And, <laughs> and, and I thought, oh, man, okay, this is, this is how it's going to be. Um, and because I've kind of had it with transformational culture, mm. right? I mean, after documenting it and for sure spending my life kind of adjacent to it from Grateful Dead culture to Oregon Country Fair to, you know, all the things of like, you know, to the Burning Man community, et cetera, always being like, well, where is the light? Where is the cutting edge of ecstatic consciousness and culture and finding it? But, you know, the biggest thing I realized then was like, you know, angels and moths are both drawn to the light, mm. you know? Right. Well so, said. right. So the hippies in the lot scene at the dead show, like, you're like, wait a second, like 30 minutes ago was church. And now we got little junkie kids with dreads, you know, scrapping for, for grilled cheeses. Like yeah. how do these things live together? Right. And more recently, like post stealing fire, you know, in the thick of where we are now in the psychedelic Renaissance, I have come to the increasing conclusion that, particularly the kind of San Francisco 
Encinitas, Boulder, you know, London, Ibiza, Tulum, Bali scene mm. is just fucking bankrupt at its core and is, and is getting nowhere and is going to deliver nothing mm. of value. So, I mean, I know that's a sweeping statement, but I'll, I'll stand by it um, and, and can unpack it in some excruciating detail, but it actually honestly bores me at this point. Um, but, so the point is, like, hearing Dennis talk, uh, and he was rounding out the conference here at, at, at uh, the Spirit Plan Medicine Conference, I got a sense, I'm like, man, this is actually different up here. And this feels fundamentally in, in a subtle but critical way, and it feels like it's, it's Cascadia, you know, it's the bioregion that kicks in in like Northern California where the redwoods start putting down their roots and all the way up here. And, and people were coming up to me after my talk and they're like, hey, man, thank you. Because was, I was talking about like ethical culture and the future and this kind of stuff. And they're like, yeah, we're doing a tree reforestation project. We're out on Salt Spring or Orcas or one of the islands, and, and we've got a sustainable off-grid farm. We've got our roots. Like, people are actually got their hands in the soil up yeah. here, and they're doing stuff. They're doing and, the work. And that feels so different than a fucking sound bath cacao ceremony right. in Pacific Heights Yeah, I mean, in San Francisco. That stuff's you still know? here, for sure. Um, I think it's probably everywhere at this point. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I do feel like I've been kind of within that network. I said before I was at that conference for five years in a row prior to. Mm -hmm. And um, within that community and other communities around here, it definitely feels like there is sincere intentions. There, there, yeah. There's an effort. But it kind of, I mean... I didn't know we we're going to get to this place so quickly, but like it kind of brought me. <laughs> I to... I had this at the very bottom of my list, but it's yeah, okay. but it, it, I mean, it, it, start yeah. by it, starting. Yeah. yeah, like it kind of brought me into like we're in a very bizarre state where we have like all this scientific research and you know the peak of scientific development as we know it with these materialistic technologies. Now discovering these, you know. Um, you know, these types of consciousness altering substances and practices that are becoming so increasingly popular in different ways and this mainstreamed and uh -huh. then commercialized. And, yeah. and then this, like, I probably what you tap into, I'm not sure what your ethical culture, uh, you know, main points are, but we're just in such a bizarre state trying to like, what, what are we, who are we, where are we, what are we? I said that and twice. I, yeah. But that's but how like, confused we are. You know what I mean? And, and I think it links back to your transformational, the, the, the link between transformational culture. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, well, and you were talking about on Rebel Wisdom quite extensively about how, you know, how, how much work do you need to do? You know, that's <laughs> part of the question, like, like yeah. polishing that last little corner of your statue or going out into the world and, and mm -hmm. doing some actual real work that's needed to be done. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's maybe what you're alluding to when you talk about um, the difference that you're noticing here, hopefully. Yeah, it feels to me like, you know, spirituality is, is wildly overrated and, and our humanity is wildly underrated. And when you do see people that are taking their stands and they're working in the schools, they're working in the farms, they're doing whatever. They could be working mm -hmm. with animals. I mean, like, take your pick. You know, somewhere where there's the intersection of your trauma and your talent. You know, like, some, your trauma is where you've, you have been broken open and you've felt the wound of the world. And your talent is, I got some kind of skill or capacity to do something about it mm -hmm. so the people behind me don't have to feel what I felt. Like, that is gorgeous, you know? And I think it's, I'd love to just be celebrating and boosting the signal of those people doing those thousand humble, small, right. local projects, not the ones trying to count the psychedelic angels on the heads of pins, man. Because mm -hmm. that, that, that's, an, that's an end game we don't have time for. Right. Yeah, I think the key word you said there was, was humble and like that and really trying to adopt and embody a humility, which... You know, it's not flashy. It's not mm -hmm. Instagram worthy, really, because it's kind of the counter of what that is. And it's yeah. it's doing your thing and, and just being as honest about yourself in a lot of ways as possible of where you're actually at, I guess, maybe personally and spiritually, and then just locally, I suppose. But yeah. Yeah. Um, now, a big bulk of the work that you've done, especially with uh, within Stealing Fire, is around ecstasis or flow state. Uh, did I say that right? Ecstasis? Ecstasis? Yeah. yeah? yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, and uh, again, it, is, it does sort of parallel that transformational uh, culture that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but, the, you know, the first question I had for you really was, how did you become interested in, in researching these different states and altered state of consciousness, which led you to uh, the Flow Genome Project? Yeah, I mean, it was just really my own life experience. I mean, none of this is anything other than just, a, you know, trying to figure out, you know, who are we, where have we come from, and where are we going? 
and you know somewhere in college found myself uh stumbling across certain tools and techniques that would launch me up into outrageously strange and interesting experiences and i would always come back the next day and be like what in the for the love of god was that about and then I'd go back into an anthropology class or a history class or a philosophy class and start trying to track the threads. You know, like, what is this kind of, like, squirrely lineage mm-hmm. of, of that Promethean spark? And, and it seemed like, you know, it would bubble up at one time and place, like ancient Greece, and then it would disappear and go underground and it would pop up somewhere else. And you could, But you could track it, you know. Like, if you knew what you're looking for, you can see where the next iteration, you've got the Templars in the Middle Ages, you know, you've got this, this basically the stuff of Graham Hancock conspiracy theories, you know. <laughs> yeah. but, but if you actually bring some rigor and some true scholarship to it, you're like, oh, man, this is like the greatest story never told. So Stealing Fire for me was really a love story of that, forgotten lineage and how we got to now and obviously you know since then it's been you know a couple of years now it's we're seeing more of those ecstatic experiences actually showing up in culture you know in communitas so it's like it's it's more like a triangle of like peak experiences plus healing plus connection and that's both its power but also it's it's sort of it's it's potential pitfalls is that we're playing with fire, we're playing with these really potent things of like peak states and, and profound healing, and we're also buggering up a lot of the social organization. So we're seeing a lot of magical thinking, we're seeing a lot of cultic tendencies, we're seeing mm-hmm. all these things, and it's highly likely to get more and more intense because as things get more and more intense, the temptation to either give away our sovereignty to somebody who seems to know what the hell's going on, you know, or to like really engage in magical thinking, like spiritual bypass. Like if I just cross my fingers, I can enter the fifth dimension or maybe blockchain will save us or maybe baby Jesus is coming or Mm. maybe or whatever, right? The temptation to like be like, this doesn't seem solvable. So I'm going to make a leap to a story that lets us off the hook. And the us is probably not all of us. It's probably me and mine. It's probably some tribal identity. It's the believers. It's the worthy. It's the whatever. And that is one I think we've got to wrap our heads around. We've almost all got to become like functional anthropologists, understand how the culture is warping and mutating at, at, at hyperspeed right now, mm-hmm. and then also take stands for healthy, pro-social, inclusive, and resilient culture, and take responsibility for our part in helping seed that. Right. And how, how would you say that uh, the work that you've uh, spent a lot of your, your time studying and understanding would help contribute to that cause? Well, I mean, you know, I, I think there's so many different voices. There's so many, you know, wonderful people in the world that are working really hard on thoughtful pieces of this problem. Like, how, where do we go from here? You know, yeah. and how, are we, how do we create anti-fragile resilient ways forward that are inclusive you know and look after the least of our brothers and sisters you know and bring us all along together so you know a massive amount of appreciation for that i think something i can't help but do and folks you know often enough say hey that's helpful when you do it is see things from a, a level or two up and see the patterns at play um and then by seeing the patterns at play that can sometimes give us more perspective and a little bit more wiggle room right. to see the mechanism instead of just what's straight in our, in our windshield. You know, like this right. is the now, this is right. in the news, this is on my Twitter feed. Yeah. Being like, ah, there's actually a bit of a longer trend line here. Mm. And, and hopefully that's helpful. And, and the other piece is offering like meta frameworks for, for making sense of things that doesn't have a dog in the fight. Right. right. So, so there's so there's content neutral. It's like yeah. conduct this experiment. Here's a way to make sure your compass shoots straight, but where you go and what you see is up to you. Mm-hmm. And so hopefully that's helpful. It's uh, it sounds like what you're uh, kind of touching on a little bit is the work from Ken Wilber and <coughs> integral theory and his basic theory of uh, I think it's uh, moral development, correct? Um, where he talks about the different stages of moral development and like getting to that level two phase where you're looking at things from a more of a macro perspective instead of being so entrenched in one level of thinking. Is that what somewhat we're referring to right now? Yeah, I mean, I think for me that goes back, um, Ken was actually riffing on Bob Keegan's work at Harvard, uh, who's the chair of adult development there. And he 
makes a really nice distinction between being subjectively immersed in something and being objectively aware of the thing. And that every you have to become objectively aware of the stage you're in to move to the next stage. Right. Right. And so for sure, that's just a natural feature of how we grow. Um, and then we're sort of at a point now where it feels like... Um, it's sort of a little bit like instead of like the singularity, it's sort of almost like the intertwingularity. Like everybody's everybody's end games, you know, are all everybody's mythologies are all smashing and crashing and, and you know intertwining as we get sucked down the drain pipe of time and space. Mm. And so it's super crazy confusing. So whether it's I'm thinking we're in the Matrix and it's a simulation or it's Star Wars or it's the Matria from Buddhism and the world teachers coming or, you know, someone saying that's the Antichrist or someone saying this is Jesus. I mean, you have both, you know, ISIS and Christian Zionists both rooting for Jesus to, to save the day at the end. The only difference in their stories is that in the end of the, the Christian one, all the Jews see the error of their ways and convert to Christianity. And the ISIS story, um, Jesus literally is the one that spears the Antichrist and then breaks the cross and says, you guys, you know, all you Christians had it all wrong. That's the symbolic breaking of the cross. Mm -hmm. And then the, the final caliphate comes in. You're like, what the hell? Like, that's crazy making on a <laughs> religious mythological yeah. level. And then we've all got our pop culture ones as well. Right. You know, whether it's Avatar or like, you know, like you could, you, I was literally thinking of like creating a rant, you know, like those random quote generators they do for like Deepak Chopra or Bob right. Dylan or that kind of thing. Yeah. Is like doing a random uh, ontology generator. Mm. Like check your box, like Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, Avatar, Matrix, Star Wars. Yep. You know, like we, like we worship Aslan. The Lion King, we, we, like we are Dumbledore's army, yeah. you know, and the Rebel Alliance yeah. defeat, you know, b rallying together to defeat Sauron and the evil empire. You're That's like, right. you could just do this fucking ridiculous mashup and everybody would know what you're talking about. Yeah. And each random one would completely be functional yeah. if you chose to enact it. So it sounds like you're trying to create a, a new modern religion with a current like mythology from pop culture in a sense. Yeah. Well, I mean, ideally more of a of a meta framework of choose your own adventure. Mm -hmm. So so Robert Anton Wilson, I think, is one of the guys that probably did some of the, you know, just, I think, f most fun, enjoyable, and precise stuff on this. He was kind of a student of Korzybski and, and general semantic theory. And he was, you know, he was a friend of Tim Leary's, and he was way into the pudding. And, and you know, their ideas were, you know, there's only humor, there's farce, there's plausible deniability, don't take any of this too seriously. You know, and his idea of like reality tunnels, you mm. know, and that was, I think Leary originally coined it, but, but Wilson popularized it. And it's just the idea of like a reality tunnel is anything that you enact as a meaning making system. Mm. And we all start with the conventional one, go to school, get good grades, get a job, get a wife, get a house, get a car, 20 years, gold watch, blah, blah, blah. Right. And that one's cracked at the seams. Right. That's pretty much thoroughly, <laughs> thoroughly collapsed around us. And then people engage in ecstatic practices or whatever. And they're like, oh, my gosh, I went down to Peru. I had this amazing experience. I went to Burning Man. Everything's different. I'm in a poly relationship. I'm whatever. And I think the key, the big temptation right now is for people just to swap out an old, tired reality tunnel for a newer, shinier, sexier mm reality tunnel and so they're still they're, they're still stuck inside a meaning making system if they start following a guru if they start following a new practice right any of these things i mean even becoming crossfitter or paleo or keto right these are all reality tunnels right and it feels like none of those is liberation that's just changing the wallpaper and the real goal would be to can we stay up on the balcony and watch all of these things hmm. and and it's not that you sit there like non-attached buddha because we're not up on a mountain, we're not in a monastery, we've got to engage, we've got to you know, throw, right. throw the thing into gear from time to time, but can we double-click into a given reality tunnel, use it, make the most of it, and the information it discloses, and, and the ways we can enact with matter and people, and then but double-click out, hmm. and still come back to center. So like, a trend, so like a transcendent uh, system of morality, in a sense that we can all agree on, in mm -hmm. a sense. And like you said, go and get the wisdom from any particular reality tunnel you're talking about. Come back and mm -hmm. be like, okay, this is what I've gained wisdom-wise from that. So the question is, how do we get all those different groups or people to agree and get along? And is that even possible? 
Well, I mean, you know, that was, I think, one of the conversations we were having with David on Rebel Wisdom was like, what is the difference between, say, what, a couple of years ago, maybe people were calling the intellectual dark web, mm-hmm. you know, so the sort of the Jordan Petersons and the Sam Harris's and, and that world, yeah. and maybe a little bit more of like where the conversation feels like it's heading a bit more these days. Right. And if I had to sort of put my finger on the difference is that most of the folks that are having the conversation today, n- none of us are actually wed to a specific position. We're wed to a as precise a m- way of making sense of multi-perspectival con- conflicting and contradictory and paradoxical reality systems as possible mm-hmm. in service of actually sense making and choice making let's figure it out and then go do stuff right and no one's got a specific dog in the fight because anything like that is going to be false certainty so like when Sam and Jordan were like hammer and tonging at each other about, you know, is religion the opiate of the masses or is meaning essential and, 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 and archetypal in a Jungian sense, you know, you've got a very clear emphasis on insides versus outsides, mm-hmm. materialism versus sort of archetypal right. um, spiritualism. And you're like, oh, guys, come on, surely there's a third path here. Right. And it feels like for sure, um, it, you know, your question about how do you get everybody to play together? Well... Um, the answer is we don't. Not going to happen. Um, and as things get, or if things get uh, less stable, uh, macroeconomically, geopolitically, whatever, whatever, um, the temptation will be to regress into tribal primates mm. <clears throat> around bands and clans. Um, and actually, our buddy Brett Weinstein mm-hmm. um, made a great point about that. He's like, hey, social justice warriors, like, be super careful of playing the identity politics card. <clears throat> because... If you do, and you start emphasizing difference and rightness and even righteousness based on my distinctions and separations from you, you're throwing an incredibly strongly encoded evolutionary switch, mm. right? Which is ethnocentric tribalism. And, and the, the bad guys <laughs> will be more than happy to play that game and you'll actually foster and create even more of them. So mm. my sense is, is that the way to help people play well together is to like double down on the infinite game of we're choosing to say all humans are created equal. Everyone's entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are inalienable rights. That shit, we just made that shit up out of thin air 400 years ago. It was a rad idea and no one had ever had it before. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? (laughs) And and therefore it is tender and it's fragile Mm. and evolution hasn't caught up to it at all. Mm. The last evolutionarily encoded thing we have is like number one, puberty. Right? That's the last mandatory bit of growing up we do. Women get another one with motherhood if they, if they have that experience. Right. Men tend not to. And the last thing that we have is oxytocin. You know, most people are like, ah, oh, it's the cuddle drug or it's the love drug. It's also the, the absolute racist, ethnocentric, tribal, like curb stomp the other drug. Wow, mm-hmm. yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, so, and that, like, that's the last one that's in our hard circuit board. So I think it's really critical. So if we have people having conversations, you know, the whole Einstein thing, like you can't solve the problem that level it creates it. And so that's always an invitation for people to go up higher to something more groovy. Mm. And it's like, actually, no, if you're trying to solve a problem higher than the level of default evolutionary encoding, you're fucked because you'll get clipped at the foundational level. Mm. So it's like, so, you know, SJW arguments about we ought to do these things. You're like, that's all elective wishful thinking based on a shared fragile mutual consensus Mm -hmm. if you actually throw the switch you're down to ethnocentric tribalism and that beats humanitarianism every single time unless we opt in even objectivity you know you take a look at like the replication crisis in social sciences you know like basically if you've seen if you've read malcolm gladwell tell you a story about a research study or you've watched it on ted odds are incredibly good that all of those studies have failed. The marshmallow experiment failed to replicate. The prison experiment failed to replicate. Mm. The so hold the pencil in your mouth and smile, priming with you know different words, all failed to replicate. And you're like, okay, shit. At the level of quantum physics, Planck's constant, Heisenberg uncertainty, right? You can measure the position or the velocity, not both. You're like the, obs- the two slit experiment and the observer impacting. Like objectivity is compromised at the quantum level. Mm. So the idea of replicating experiments and hoping to get persistence, you're like, of course it's different and of course it's changing. Same with SJWs and tribalism versus humanitarianism. And then the same for um, 
The same for game theory. So like if we want if we want to play better to, with each other, right? And we're having this conversation in the um the psychedelic research community right now. Mm. Right? Cuz I just came back from London and was having meetings with a number of the academics and the researchers there and then was giving a talk at the MAPS conference in Austin before coming here for this plant medicine conference. So it was like literally like coast to coast to coast in, I don't know what, six days of nice super intense, um, really meaningful conversations. And, and a number of people in the psychedelic research space are deeply committed, open-hearted, profoundly well-intentioned folks doing beautiful, needed work. Right. And at the same time, they're like, they're wrestling with, well, how do we do... How do we take on funding? And there are private for-profit companies. There's a ton of capital yes. coming into this space. There's yes. all these things. And they're like, well, you know, maybe we can. You know, everybody seems to be nice. Um, you know, it's for a good cause. Like all of these, you know, really heartfelt, sincere things. And then you're like, okay, but wait. Like game theory dictates that. When there's scarce resources, right, you're going to see rent-seeking behavior, meaning like if I start winning, I'm going to change the rules behind me mm -hmm. so that I keep winning, right, right, yep. and um, and Daniel Schmachtenberger, you know, lays this out nicely, but he talks about the multipolar trap, you know, which is the idea of like if there's a non-zero chance somebody's going to do the dick move, right, <laughs> and whether that's cut down the last redwood or or, or fish the last giant tuna. Right, that's now going to be worth five times as much on the sushi fish markets in Tokyo, <laughs> right? Because it's the last one, yep. right? Um, or patent a modification of psilocybin, right? right? Or corner the market on an IP lockup on something. If there's chance that someone might, then even an otherwise reasonable person will say, "Well, it might as well be me." Mm -hmm. And so we have these we have these incredibly delicate movements and I know we, we kind of steered off yeah. your broader question yes. of how do we get all the different groups to play together but in laying out those three things the idea of like hey I'm under convinced when I hear really smart people thinking about really complex ways like for co-creative emergence and all these kind of like fancy waistcoats <laughs> kinds of stuff it's like no I think we actually have to figure out what's going to work in a like an, a refugee camp What's going to work when people are standing in line at their volunteer fire department because the power's been out like it has been in San Francisco mm. for a few weeks? Like what happens when humans get to the nitty gritty, right. not what might we do in a hypothetical best case scenario if we all suddenly start behaving way the hell better than we have been in ideal conditions? Hmm. You know, and so that's what I mean about the anti-fragility is can we get down to the levels of deep-rooted structural drivers that persist even as environmental conditions get harder, not more and more optimal. And I think, like you touched on that earlier, like humility is a huge part to play because mm -hmm. going out and planting trees isn't as sexy as posting a photo from Bernie Man or something like that. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, one that came to mind for me was uh, some of the work that Bill Gates is doing. Like he's uh -huh. literally figuring out sanitation for third world countries because that is a uh -huh. huge problem that they're having. So he had a huge project where he's getting different companies or groups to donate tons of money to create uh, a sanitation system to deal with the waste problems in third world countries because that's one of the biggest issues that they face. Mm -hmm. And to me, I don't, I'm not sure if I mean, he probably has done some sort of uh, psychedelic medicine at some point, but that seems like the work that kind of needs to get done, like mm -hmm. figuring out how to get rid of like human waste as opposed to mm -hmm. sort of these more abstract and theoretical ideas. Yeah, and I mean, in fact, I was just reading a Vanity Fair article with Melinda Gates. It was like the Proust questionnaire at the end of Vanity Fair, and she was answering it. And she was like, you know, what's the worst thing that what's the worst thing you can think of in the world? And it was basically seeing like basically an innocent child dying needlessly. You mm -hmm. know, like that was the hardest thing for her. And you think, okay, thank you guys. Like, thank you. That's beautiful. You know, and there's been arguments in the last ten years of like techno philanthropy. You know, basically the big billionaires doing the thing that government and the other social networks and churches and things used to do but haven't done as mm -hmm. much anymore. And, right. you know, thank you. And on the one hand, it's great. And, and, and the positive work they're doing is, you know, is potentially world, world helping. I wouldn't go as far as saying world changing. Um, and it's also deeply problematic, you know, at a structural level because anything that is centralized even from the smartest, wealthiest people on the planet, 
right, is still a person's singular decision versus crowdsourced, decentralized, grassroots, bottom up. And, you know, the classic example of that one is, is you know, like when, who was it? It was uh, Gorbachev. I think it was Gorbachev and his uh, ministers came to the U.S., and they stopped in Houston and were in a supermarket, you know? And, right, yes, yeah. Right, and the minister was like, wait a second, this thing is packed with stuff. How mm. did the hell did you guys do this? And how did you organize this? And they were like, well, you know, it was just a thousand tiny market-based decisions by all the different people, the baker and the butcher and the, you know, the cheese baker and the truck drivers. And this is how we did it. We did it with an open, you know, nominally free market. Mm -hmm. And they're like, okay, there's no way we can beat this. And I'm sure that that's far too tidy to be the way it actually happened. You know, like that's one of those chestnut stories. But right. like, but there is a point there because like, so Bill Gates, you know, they looked in Africa and they're like, hey, mortality, what's the highest leverage point? All this kind of stuff. And they're like, okay, malaria, let's get mosquito nets, distribute mosquito nets. That's massive ROI, you know, and dropped malaria. But, you know, in those central African republics, Democratic Republic, Congo, et cetera, Suddenly there was population booms. Mm. There was then food shortages. There was a rise in more warlords. There was increase in civil war. Crazy, right? right? And you're like, oh, fuck. So you don't know the knock-on effects. <laughs> yeah, the the, the knock-on effects and and the idea of the centralized tops down. Like it's, mm. I think it's, you know, why aren't Jeff Bezos or Elon working on desalinization? Mm. Why aren't they working on carbon sequestration? Why are they fulfilling boyhood fantasies to build rockets and beat each other to Mars? Like, that's some fucked up shit. Like, that is an opportunity cost. Like, let's say they're 100% successful. How many of what will be over 8 billion humans get a ride on one of those things before this place is reduced to a smoldering husk? Mm -hmm. Not many. Like, a thousandth or a millionth of 1%. And who will, that be? who will those be? Will it be all the MacArthur geniuses and all the UN delegates and Mother Teresa and her ilk? Or will it be the billionaire's buddies who can all plunk down a quarter million bucks for a Virgin Galactic ticket? And you're like, okay, now that is whack. Right. So, so that's what I mean about, like, can we create the open source and decentralized tools by which people in their own homes, with their own communities and their own families and their own sovereign sense of what they actually need? Mm have the tools to go and provide that for themselves. Because like then you let a thousand fires burn, not relying on one, and you know, 900 will go out. But a hundred that we couldn't have thought of and the smartest think tanks ever will thrive, hmm. you know, and then they will mimetically perpetuate and spread. And like, that's how we get this done. So that would be my hope. So it's sort of a free market approach to solving the, the bigger issues in the world. Um, and that would be like, you know, like you said, at a grassroots level, at a local level, um, not as centralized, letting that happen. Uh, however, you know, living in a city like Vancouver, for example, we have a lot of regulations. And we can't mm -hmm. even, you know, yeah. there's like a lot of things we can't even get away oh, with. We're trying to get an permit. infrared sauna here for the last you know, three months, but, you know. It's so, I mean, there's, there's going to be those things. natural stumbling blocks, but, I, yeah. you know, uh, so it sounds like you're somewhat advocating for maybe like a, a deregulation combined with free market solutions to these bigger problems, and hopefully they'll be solved at a more grassroots level. Is that is that what I'm hearing here? Well, I mean, yeah, and let's also come back to the human side, right, because this almost started getting, you know, sounds like a policy wonk discussion, but my <laughs> sense is, like, it's all of it, right? It is absolutely, sure, absolutely all of it. Yeah, it's all part of it. Yeah. And, and then how do we, you know, help people self-initiate into um, their highest and best selves, mm. right? Because that feels like a key part as well. Totally. Right? right? And so, you know, if we've just been talking about like the techno-economic elements, then what's the psycho-spiritual and cultural elements? And, you know, that's where it feels like, um, you know, there has been a collapse in organized religion yes. broadly. Yeah. But there's been a spike in, in either <clears throat> evangel you know evangelical pentecostal and and fundamentalist religious strains mm -hmm. so it's sort of like the reasonable middle has been hollowed out um, and then we've got the rise of extreme experiential sects 
right? And you can, and on the progressive, like non-believing side, you could say Wim Hof, you know, right. <laughs> is, 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 you know, it's an indicator. They're like, it's For like, sure. like, don't sit there like mindfulness, mindfulness based stress reduction. No, like, fuck that, man. I'm going to be like naked in a, in a kiddie pool <laughs> <laughs> up to my tits in ice and hyperventilating until I see stars. Like, let's do that. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, Extreme yeah. experience. Yeah. Cause yeah. like, we're so well, disembodied. Well, isn't, isn't extreme enough. I don't know. It's, exactly. it's too, it's more difficult to sit in silence for 10 minutes than it is to jump in an ice bath and, and, yeah. you know, hallucinate because of, you know, breathing techniques. Right? Yeah. So, so we're like so disembodied these days mm. that I think we're just, people are just desperate yeah. to feel anything and they don't necessarily mind whether that's sustainable or not. Yeah. Um, but so that said, right, how do we create experiences that let people have safe, reproducible peak experiences come back and mend and integrate their trauma so they're not reenacting mm. old banged up patterns and connect and collaborate with a little bit more joy, a little bit more generosity, a little less tendency to get hijacked by game theory mm. dynamics, which is just brutal Machiavellian, you know, Ayn Rand, tit for, tat. <laughs> tit for tat, sucks to be you, win, lose. Like, yeah. how can we actually start exploring win, win? And the only way we get to play win, win games mm. with each other is if there's a sense and probably a reality of enoughness. Right. You know? do, you think, do you think like some sort of recalibration of our sensitivities would be in order? Because we are pretty hyper stimulated. Like we need that extreme experience or just like the fastest technology or whatever it is. But it's almost like we need to like one thing we've, you know, we look at float house in some ways is kind of a social experiment in the sense that, mm -hmm. well, how are people going to adopt this very unique practice of going to, you know, the most externally sense reduced environment we can create. And you know, it's, it's been very fascinating just to kind of see the sort of adoption patterns or lack thereof and, mm. and what that's like. And so, so speak to that a little moment. We said adoption patterns or lack thereof. Do you mean people come a few times but don't necessarily learn how to integrate it? Totally. Absolutely. Uh -huh. You know, like it's, it's very, um, it's almost not stimulating enough, mm -hmm. well, one, which one is kind of the whole point. One complaint you will get is, I got bored, mm -hmm. right? And, um, you know, my, I, I'll, have an, I'll have an answer for that. And I, you know, I, I won't be condescending about it. I'll just say, you know, mm -hmm. you had a whole world of opportunity you could have ex explored. You could have maybe solved problems in your life. You could have looked inside. You could have had a pure uh, interoceptive sensory experience and see what's going on internally. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you needed the external stimuli basically coming in to fulfill that experience. And when you shut mm -hmm. that off, it's interesting to see some of the reactions right. that you get. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I think that that's part of it. Hmm. And it's, it's, I mean, yeah. like you said, like it's, it's, uh, it's hard to sit with yourself for a while. Yeah. You know, I think it actually is, is work. That's the thing. It's like when you go mm -hmm. in there uh, for an hour to 90 minute session, um, you're going to get twitchy. You're going to have the urge mm -hmm. to get out. You're going to be thinking, what, why am I floating in this tank? What am I doing? Like, what's the point of all of this? Um, and that's, that's mm -hmm. when I when I feel those little twitchy sensations or those thoughts come in. That's my, my mental cue is just stay in, just stay in, just keep going and observe that feeling mm -hmm. and then work through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, and I'm sure it's not made any better by people literally going through like dopamine withdrawal while they're in the float tank because you know the whole phantom phone syndrome of like 90 percent of people mm -hmm. imagining it buzzing in their pocket. Right, right. Like that's actually just basically like I am itching for the sugar high mm. of novelty and a little red number that says I've got a friend or a like or a, you know, or a follow. Right. And, and so, yeah, so in that 90 minutes, they're, they're going through a mild dopamine detox and that's right. gonna leave them grouchy and cranky and wanting more stimulation. But to be fair, I, in a float tank, have been like, fucking A, this, is gonna be, this would be so much better if we had cables and pulleys and bungees and you could apply like self-directed <laughs> traction, like right. like starfish, right. Vitruvian man. So like when we're going to kit one out, um, and A, bang in tunes, I don't need Enya or like seascapes. So I'm a bit of a, I think I, I calm, I zero out with something to do versus right. nothing to do. Right, right. Right. So it could be like that, you know, for sure. I mean, you, you do what Lily did, right? Who was the founder. I mean, he would just be on heroic doses of LSD or ketamine. Right. Well, then you're sorted. You're definitely not bored. <laughs> you're obliterated. You're sure. not bored, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. If, you're, if you're doing it as folks are now in a semi kind of spa-like approach, mm -hmm. um, I can understand 
You know, like you're like, yeah. okay, if you don't have a, a tension training or meditative practice for yourself already, right. it might be a little totally just fun, like weird for them to find their way through it right. without a few more handrails. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's sort of what, like you're, you're touching on the difference between, say, a Vipassana meditation practice and uh, like an experiential fusion, which would be more of a flow state. So like, you know, mm -hmm. for example, watching the thoughts go by as opposed to being engaged in, say, a, a movie or some sort of activity. And I think that's, they're uh -huh. two different things in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And full disclosure, I'm a crap meditator. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and that's the thing, like, I guess what I was trying to get to with that is, is how, sorry, it's just my camera there. Um, like, I, because I, I mean, it's, because when, I, when we we both just had a float before this oh, podcast nice. you know what i mean and it's like and i went in there with with nothing no audio nothing like the purest kind of you know float form you could say uh -huh. and you know it's it's just like yeah you can be in there and kind of get twitchy or whatever or you can just be like mesmerized by the ex, by the experience of being yes. yes like when you kind of tap into like i'm like this consciousness and what is that? And go into that sort of revelry and and have an experience. That, like I mean, it's it's like you're on the screaming edge of the big bang wave because you're in the present <laughs> moment and just like this is what the hell? Is? Like you know, you're a part of that connection. You can kind of make that whole visceral connection back to it. And um, I mean, that's it's just I guess it's a matter of perspective, I suppose, and what you can actually tap into and how you want to relate to it. Yeah, and it's such a curious thing if we're thinking about like culture architecture because there was actually a fellow at the conference this weekend. He's like, hey, I really liked your talk because I was talking about ethical culture and here's the potential like toolkit we can play with. And he's like, I really liked it, but, it, but I was also very frustrated by it. And I said, oh, that's interesting. How come? And he said, well, I'm a Unitarian minister. And the reality is I felt like jumping up and screaming like, that's us. Like everything you're describing as like this future potential hmm. – that's us. We've already been doing it for like 150 mm. goddamn years. That's us. And I'm like, well, look, mate. And I, and I for sure heard him. And I was like, and to push back on you, no one gives a shit about Unitarians anymore. Like they're passing you standing still. So like either you guys have to adapt or die. Mm. And like, so that's one challenge. But on the other hand, the question is, do we all devolve to Instagram filtered selfie taking <laughs> cotton candy high? So like, how do we at the same time, like the same way Osho like came up with dynamic meditation because he's like, hey, Westerners in the 20th century have way too much charge. They got to get their yayas out versus like monastic Eastern 15th century. So let's do it. Let's actually steer into that skit and like jump and shake and scream and shout and then sit quiet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. that, that was, a I thought, a novel adaptation to the time. Right. So I wonder, you know, what is that for any of these techniques and right. you know and how do we do that how do we adapt and stay current without pandering to the lowest common denominator because well, then you've lost the thing right. that made it worthwhile i mean kind of just riffing off of that a little bit i mean one of the biggest things that i've noticed myself and i think with other people is like if you do some sort of physical exercise and exert yourself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. beforehand like kind of like the osho example like uh -huh. you you get your energy out and like the disconjointed energy within you and you're kind of just relaxed and flowing like after you've done a hard workout you go and sit on the couch you're like ah, i feel great physically mentally everything and then and that's actually but i'm still awake and i'm not i'm not falling into sleep yet that's the time if you're interested in that sort of thing is to go into a meditative state you mm -hmm. know it's like this is the ideal time and mm -hmm. so and a lot of our work here is just a lot of a lot of education process and and mm -hmm. but also letting people you know find their own way with it you know like like you said like there's mm -hmm. so many different ways to approach spirituality or meditation or stress management or whatever it is mm -hmm. and you know this is kind of just well here's a place we created to let people do what they want to do and how they want to do it you know uh -huh. keeping that open source a little bit more too yeah right um but coming back to, coming back to your idea of like you know from again that grassroots perspective um you know it sounds like you're, again, talking about creating some sort of contemporary, I hate to use the word religion, in a sense, mm -hmm. to give people the, um, the guidance or the reality tunnel that, that they need in order to, uh, you know, again, get out of their own way, get out of their self and be, become more selfless and do that work that needs to get done. Um, you know, how do you have some sort of a framework or model <laughs> in your mind around how that could be achieved? Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, the, the, what's the Wheelian religion? Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's 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 not that right. It's it's not um, 
a doctrine or a dogma. So in some respects, like the tagline for it could just be like, believe what you want to believe. Just never lose the faith. Hmm. Right? That idea of like, what you can skin it, you can run whatever mind movie you want over these neurophysiological protocols. Can but you? if you combine, you know, breathing, uh, movement, specifically like fascia, soft tissue, uh, pelvic tilts and, and, and undulations, spinal mobility, that kind of stuff, uh, sexuality, music, and substances in skillful ways, you can knock yourself sky high and have an ineffable initiatory experience of the suchness of things, uh, your true nature, everything that you forgot, everything you still have to do, mm -hmm. right? All the places you're banged up and still need to mend and exactly who you love and what your stand is on the earth. Mm. And you can do that with a special friend or you can do that by yourself. And, and like that um, is like self-disclosing. So there's no need for you or me or anyone else to say what that experience is unless we're actually in it. And if we're in it, it shows us what, is, what it's about and what's next. And I don't quite understand the mechanism there, and I don't presume <laughs> to ever pin that one down, right. right? But I mean, I think we've all had those experiences that are uncannily on point. You know, custom tailored to us. It's not like you pick up the phone and it's like someone gibbering in Czech or or, or <laughs> Russia, and you're like, oh, this is for me, right? <laughs> and and often like a wicked ass sense of humor, mm. you know, mm -hmm. pun, mm. farce, mm. bitch slaps, whatever. You're like, how is this even done? <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know. And then you're like, okay, okay, thank you. I nearly forgot. I thought I hadn't, but I had. Now I remember, and I'm back to I'm back on Monday morning mm. to like to 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 pick back up my load. Yeah. And to do that with a little bit more lightness and a little right. bit more confidence that I'm not just wandering lost in the woods. Right. So that's, that's what I would... Uh, so figuring know. out that flow, how to get into the flow state, essentially. Well, and spe more specifically, um, how to get access to the information layer that appears to be accessible in non-ordinary states. Mm, um, yes. That is the autodidactic bit, meaning it teaches itself. Right. right. Yeah. How do you, how does the individual get there? That's yeah, and, yeah. And it's easier than ever. So there's a dozen ways to blow yourself sky high. And what are your favorites? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean, hmm, I mean, basically, uh, what has emerged is a like if you pursue all this stuff, if you follow the research, and then you conduct the experiments without being squeamish or flinching. You know, you're just truly open, curious, methodological explorer. Um, you sort of, like, all roads lead to some form of sexual yoga. Wow. Hmm. Um, like tantric. Yeah, tantra. but, but, but not tantric in the sense of, like, namaste and yonis and vajras. And, no, and but, like, I know, but, but like going through that same a, place. A, a, psycho, a psychosexual alchemical initiatory protocol. Hmm. You know, so it either ends up as like super sexy biohacking, right? Right. Or really nerdy kink. Right. Right. <laughs> One or the other. So, yeah. And, yeah. And you don't have to like, and, and if for whatever reason that's torquing people out, you're like, okay, just back out all the sexy stuff. Do all the other stuff. You just have to do it longer, more intensely. Mm -hmm. So like there's a, you know, like I said, there's the respiration movement, sexuality, um, music and substances. Combine them and you can get higher into the information layer in shorter periods of time with less body load or psychological disruption, right? Mm -hmm. Then if you lobbed 500 micrograms, a heroic dose of five grams of silent darkness and it took you six months to put the pieces back together, right? right. So for date, you know, for weekly practice, monthly practice, episodic practice, yes. super badass, right? And it also lets you integrate more because, you know, I mean, what's the point? Like, the weak link in us, the weak link in accessing these non-ordinary states is not the bandwidth of the, the non-ordinary states. I mean, think about the explosion and like access to 5-MeO DMT and even just regular old DMT, right? <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. plain old humdrum <laughs> hyperspace. And then dimethyl. Yeah. You know. which, which sidebar, right? I mean, <laughs> Imperial, I was sitting with the researchers from Imperial and, and one of their patrons and they are about to go down the motherfucking rabbit hole they are about to do extended dmt so if you guys have heard of like i've the, heard of this the yes. dmtx project is yes. a version but these guys are doing it at imperial they're going to be doing iv dmt dropping people into right. hyperspace for hours right hours for a five-year program and the explicit design intentions is contacting 
contacting entities, establishing precognition, right, and and non-local shared reality. So like two or three people in different rooms, like I'm showing you a picture, or you see, you know, like basically 1970s, like MK Ultra, Stanford Research wow. Institute, like psyops plus entity contact. And I'm like, I'm like, holy fuck, guys. Like, are you serious? That's the goal. Yeah. And, I was, and, 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 they're, and they're like, so what do you think? What do you think? And, 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 and I was like, uh, I was, I was like, cause, and they were still trying to like justify it. I'm like, I'm like, I'm all with you. I'm tracking you 100%. I'm like, what if that shit works? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like, it's like yeah. the dog chasing the car. Like, what happens when you catch that bumper and the motherfucker right. pulls onto the highway? Like, what are you, what are then you going to Then what? And yeah. they're like, oh, no, no, we're going to screen everybody. Like, everyone's going to be screened for like psychological stability and even the, you know they've had some exposure to dmt i'm like that's entirely inadequate right. you're like are you selecting like quantum ninja spec ops guys <laughs> seriously you must yeah. to go seriously. duke it out in hyperspace like so the fact that that is happening at a prestigious research institution i think right. is just a sign of the deep weirdness of the times we're in i almost feel like they should go <laughs> get like some of the most you know established multi-decade curanderos from peru uh-huh. and because those guys are probably the ones that have gone the furthest I was like, do you know how many bad sci-fi movies start exactly like this? <laughs> you know, yeah. you're, you're like, yeah. we, or, or even Stranger Things, like we ripped a hole open, we can't close it. Exactly, like, Man. it's the same thing. But and then my my thought was like, I wonder if it would ever become the the, the 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 discoveries would be so profound it could be that unifying effect like you know if we all learn there's a meteor coming to Earth mm-hmm. and like that's yeah. what bound you know binds us together. Like maybe that's like it's so transcending and you know they can start to replicate it and give people that experience. It's, Boom. I mean, that's yes. that's the whole putting the faith in the substance thing. But it could happen. No, for sure. That's like that is a legit point. Which is how do we get beyond the ethnocentric game theory, tribalism, lowest common denominator, and right. the, and the only way that it can happen. So, I mean, and I normally I'm super provisional in my language. It's just this is a non-negotiable. It would just we would have to be operating from a global centric point of view, mm-hmm. and the only way to get to a global centric point of view is to glimpse something more than it. Mm-hmm. Right, like egocentric, I have to realize there's me and my mommy. Yes. Ethnocentric, I have to realize there's us and them. Right, yep. so to get to global centric, I have to actually realize there's something beyond the globe. Mm. So I have to have some glimpse of cosmocentric reality in order to anchor. Right, right. Like so, the astronauts did it with the flyover effect. They're like outside of the planet. They actually yeah. are like we're all one. It's yes. amazing. Right, not everybody gets that experience. So, right. not psychonauts yet. instead of astronauts. That's a play, and obviously the one a good one in a gajillion notion of like benevolent interdimensional contact <laughs> that doesn't fuck with our world right, right? and just just like hey we're here you know <laughs> think about it guys get your shit together we love you yeah. but we're not gonna like do anything else no more probes you know yeah. right like what are the odds of that happening I don't um, know. Fingers crossed for that one. Fingers, fingers crossed. I've, I've heard enough ayahuasca post ceremony talks. I'm like, it's not out of the realm of possibility. Oh my gosh. There was this woman, this like full on big haired, classic Austin, Texas woman, like big blonde hair, and she was with uh, she was with my wife at an ayah ceremony, and she comes out of it and she's like I got pulled up into a UFO. <laughs> She's a complete novice to say no, to right. say nothing. The UFO, and there was a giant blinking sign that said, raise your frequency. Can, can anybody tell me what that meant? And you're like, oh, honey. Oh, honey. That's well, awesome. Congratulations. That, you got a glimpse. Yeah. Raise wow. your fucking frequency. I mean, you can't make this shit up. That's you know? perfect. <laughs> That's so perfect. And she still didn't get the message. You're like, oh my God. But how That's beautiful. So scale, but I love hearing yeah. that stuff coming back because when you hear other people talk about their experiences, it, it does start to like reinforce your understandings of different levels of truth. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, it's like, like I know exactly what that means, at least in my paradigm of my life experiences. But I'm like, yeah, I'm like, Jesus, like, it's cool to hear it come back that way in, in that sort of fashion. But yeah, well, well I mean, man. I mean, to, to that point, though, so now we're talking about like the intertwingularity. We're talking about yes. end of days, meaning making. We're talking about everybody's myths smashing and crashing into each other. And we're talking about people right. having a bunch more access to super high witness. Right. And then like yes. what happens at some point? And I don't know. If and when it's going to, I mean, no, it's for sure going to happen. I just don't know how cleanly it'll happen. But at what point do people go like full red pill? Mm. You know, like, oh my God, nothing is as it seems. Right. We're living in mythological times, right? And right. all of this is secondary to some other realities that have punched through, bleed, bled through, or shown up. And then, you know, everyone will, be, like everyone who is not integrated is going to just lose their fucking shit. Right. Yes. 
Yeah. Do you think like, you know, the indigenous wisdom that is, you know, is legit, let's just say for lack Mm -hmm. of a term, could become a very important role for that sort of scenario just because like I feel like that type of wisdom was developed over d- millennial tens and thousands of years of human evolution to come mm-hmm. in sort of like this conscious relationship of re- with reality animism shamanism mm-hmm. and I think th- those things are so old and there's I mean there's the parts of it that you know well, wh- why we have to you know skin this deer's head this way that's kind of maybe not relevant now but there's elements of it that are could act as like a legitimate framework for mm-hmm. that future global <laughs> connection that we need to kind of live by. So ancient wisdom. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's a super hard saying not knowing, right? right? I mean, there's the Kogi, there's there's varying tribes that seem to be holding some legit information for the rest of us. Mm. There's also a lot of new age mangling, mm. you know, like hope you prophecy this that and the other and all that kind of stuff. So it's super hard to get back to intact indigenous elder wisdom that's not been mangled right. by howlies, right? And so, you know, for our own self-serving mythologizing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that said, I mean, dear lord, I don't know. Like like we right. it, it is such, you know, and I think that was something where, you know, uh, Ken Wilber in particular, right? He was one who constantly said, don't look backwards in human evolution for some mm-hmm. idealized state of Eden. Mm. Like they were, their life was nasty, brutish and short. Don't mistake what a shaman could bring through for the center of gravity of their culture. It, the way out is forwards, only and always forwards. Mm, right, okay. And, <clears throat> and, you know, reading that stuff in my 20s and a retro romantic myself, I'm like, okay, cool like thank you Uh, i'll keep moving forwards instead of looking back for where we lost the plot right but you know there's just undeniably some profound wisdom in indigenous traditions and it's not all retro and some of it is essential knowledge that we are on you know at risk of losing Mm. um and so i think you know it's obviously going to be both right And, and and you know i mean capitalism like french enlightenment Rational individualism, scientific revolution, free market democracy, you know, as a nominal paired experiment, but clearly China's breaking that one. You <laughs> yes. know, they're like, we can do capitalism just fine, thanks yeah. to the totalitarian state. In fact, we make decisions a whole lot fucking faster than you guys can. Right. Um, but all of that, like, it was a massive novelty engine. Mm. Like, that's what capitalism does. Mm. So it has turned, it has sucked up matter and spat out new configurations of matter faster and better than anything else has ever done that Mm. um but it's done it without a connection to an ethic and it's done with it's done while externalizing uh its true costs that haven't been in the balance of the market and it's done and and it's and it's fostered a tragedy of the commons as well so we're in like this space of hyper novelty that none that the planet's ecology isn't used to and can't adapt to that we can't culturally and then it just has tribal primates can't handle Mm. and what what's the intersection between that and then the way humans have always lived you know and all the wisdom that's been accumulated from all that time i mean Mm. it feels to me like we're gonna go like if things decohere as thoroughly as they might it's gonna be like the folks that are gonna be least affected are the indigenous subsistence folks. Yes. The folks doing hard scrabble backyard farms up in the mountains, eking out a living, yeah. dealing with the local regional trade network. Like, not much is going to fall from there. They're going to be like, we've been doing this all along. Yes. It's going to be the zoo animals in the suburbs who are freaked when their air conditioning goes off. Yeah. You know, and the, and the food in their fridge starts spoiling. Yeah. Like, those guys are going to go through the floorboards. Yeah, we'll be the 28 you know? days later people. <laughs> yeah. The zombies <laughs> running around. What's going on? Yeah, but, and it, you yeah. know, and and who knows? I mean, it, it is such a yeah. mind fuck to be like, hmm. It's always been a fool's errand to think the end is nigh, and somehow, against all odds, we sure do seem like we are. You know, we've drawn a short straw on maybe being a generation that's going to live through a worldwide scale set of experiences that define us. You know, yeah, right, yeah. I mean, my, I mean, I think it's we're, we're tinkering on the, on, we're on the edge, we're on the brink of something. Everyone can kind of feel it. We can sense it. You know, I hate to but say is that it, sometimes is that an existential <laughs> thing. Is that just a, a within our? Is that is, does every generation have that? But what I was going to uh-huh. say was, you know, uh-huh. sometimes it, it, 
the, some of the greatest catalysts for change mm-hmm. in my own experience have been pain and fear as much as I hate to say that when mm-hmm. I'm in enough pain, it will drive me to create the change that I need to create in my life. You know, mm-hmm. if I'm really comfortable, well, I'm good. I'm sort of status quo, you know? And mm-hmm. it's like, maybe it takes, um, you know, s- some major pain to go through in some way in order for us to wake up enough to be like, Oh, we don't want that anymore. hundred percent. Right. And there's an awful lot of awakening, just in, not, not in a, in a groovy sense, but just in like a waking up yeah. to that pain in the last few years a lot of us are also getting hijacked by it, Mm -hmm. you know, and the really humbling ones, because sometimes like, especially people in the spiritual space, they'll start playing with time scales. Catastrophizing. Well, well, or they'll be like, well, you know, maybe this is in the cosmic time frame. This is exactly what needs to happen. You're like, yeah, that's fine. That doesn't help me and my kids. Mm -hmm. Like I really, I've got a skin in this game, you know, clock time. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, a humbling one for me was that idea that after the fall of Rome, it took until the signing of the declaration of independence (laughs) <laughs> before he had returned to that standard of living. Jesus. He's like, Ooh, that's a while. <laughs> you know? So we got to yeah. rescue our father from the depths. We can't let, like, we have to keep what's good about our culture, discard what needs to be discarded, but also not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I, th- I think that um, that's, one of the, that's one of the most important things I've been feeling in the last month even, mm-hmm. is just like, that notion of like we have to start playing the infinite game like a win-win the long game the long game that is win-win and the point of the game is to be able to keep playing it with as many people as possible not a win-lose right Mm -hmm. and it's not something new you know it you can really trace it you know um you can trace it back through the entire western tradition you know you can trace it to the magna carta like hey divine right of kings not so much like, we're going to start constraining this with rules and, like, British civil tort law and the idea that, like, no man is above the law. Like, those mm-hmm. weren't might makes right. You, know, you can go back to King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Like, that's one of the first articulations. Like, Hammurabi, eye for a motherfucking eye, like, back in the day, right? Yeah. But you get Knights of the Round and you're like, oh, wow. Like, this is non-hierarchical mm-hmm. code of chivalry. There's actually, mm-hmm. you're powerful. You're, like, six foot six on a fucking war horse. You can just swipe anybody you want, mm-hmm. right? But you shouldn't. Right. You know, uh, yes. and, and, and so we see this evolution and, and Rousseau, like blank slates and, and liberté, egalité, fraternity. And you're like, OK, this evolution. And then, you know, the, the founding fathers in this country being like, how has it been done? Mm. We're the white ass patriarchal slave owning land holders, but we're going to create rules to a game that actually tie our hands. Right. right? We're going to yeah. play Cincinnati, not Nero. We're going to say reluctant leadership on behalf of the body politic, right, in service of our nation and the, and the beliefs it was founded on, and then I'm going to give back the ring of power, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, this is the thing. Mm-hmm. And so, I, you know, the idea that, yes, Jefferson and Sally Hemings and George Washington was a bastard and all these things, 100%, absolutely. And we cannot, I think, trample the gift Right, that is our legacy because it's because back to fragility, like this is a tender and delicate thing that goes Mad Max feudalism in a heartbeat. Just look at Mexico, right? right? You don't have to go far, like, no. you know, wind back the clock a decade here or a decade there, or travel a thousand miles in any direction, right. and you're in the shit. It's there, and you're like, whoops, wow, okay, so now I get that sense. And so then you even see like colonialism, right? You know, Brits and French and Spanish, all of it, through Africa, through India, through Asia, you know, South America. And and you're like, there was so much genocide and so much atrocity and so much tragedy. And it's critical that we like hold that and make amends for that. And at the same time, you kind of get it. This is my experience um, at uh, Santos at the Royal Military Academy in, in England. In their chapel, seeing all the columns with all the accounts of all the officers who had been killed in the different battles. And it goes back to like Afghanistan in the 1890s, Hmm. you know, Crimea, the Boer War in South Africa. You like literally see like legacy of conquest, but also, right, the propagation of these ideals. And so imperfect, messy humans, you know, economics, power politics, all that too. But somewhere in there is that flame of justice, Right, that is saying, you know, that is holding up that global centric promise of right makes might, not might makes right. And and so like that that is a rare and precious thing. So I feel like we've got to be like and you know, Lincoln did that at the Gettysburg Address, 
right? He's like, we didn't come here today to, be, to, to bury the dead. We came here to recertify that original promise, right? Obama did the same thing after the, the bombings, you know, with those, those the, in the church. He's like, we need to dust this fucker off, stand it back up, and keep going, mm. you know, and pissed off radicals on any side will say, not fast enough, not quick enough. We want to burn the sucker down. Mm. And it's like, be super careful. Yeah. Be super careful when we get to that sort of infantile rage because when we burn it down we will all be in the smoldering wreckage and it will take far longer far far longer to rebuild than it took to burn no doubt that's crazy man i've never heard i've never thought of it that way in terms of just looking and i'm sure many people have into like looking back on how something like colonialism just for an example that there was there was a a, a truth purpose behind that, the globalism truth well mm-hmm. yeah like that that's well, that idea fucking powerful you know, and, and, you know jordan peterson does talk about this quite a bit about how like the idea of the west is that every individual has a divine spark within all of us and that's like the universal thing we all have a spark of divinity that which means we have some sort of inherent value uh and that's the one transcendent quality that maybe maybe that we do have in the west that has uh you know putting the individual sort of as a priority over the, the whole, like the group in a sense and making sure that that sort of divine, sp- or that, that recognition of the divine spark is yeah, always there. I mean, I, mean I, th- like, I feel like he's, he's fudging like a Jungian analysis with a, with a historical political assessment. And I don't buy that. I think that that's a cram down um, or would require much more evidence on his part to really support a statement like that. But nonetheless, right. The evolution of these things and like even take it a step further, like, um, and this is like deep history nerd. If you guys are okay with this, because like, because because, and I've shared this before, but like normally I'm not on Stephen Pinker's side, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Normally I'm like, oh man, come on, you're just like you're you're whistling past the graveyard. All you're doing is cherry picking the positive facts. You're ignoring so much pain and disruption in the world. Not buying it. But lately I've really been coming back around. I'm like, oh man, I hundred percent get his argument because he's saying, hey, the Enlightenment has done all these things. Right, the world is getting better because of this meme, mm. and we have to honor and protect this meme. <laughs> what's, right? the, what's the meme? Well, the meme is the rational enlightenment. Exactly, all the things you were just saying that right, you ascribed right. to Peterson. But I wouldn't say Western history time immemorial. I would say that's been more of an evolution we can trace, and you can really time stamp it. You know, seventeen fifties kind of on. Um, and and his point is, you know, child literacy, infant mortality, war, all these things because of this value system. Um, And it's even crazier, like particularly in the States, because, you know, for those people who have seen Hamilton, right, and are familiar with that play, right, I mean, the the, the dialectic that was the American experiment was Thomas Jefferson versus Alexander Hamilton, right? And Alexander Hamilton was like, we need to go and engage banks, finance, markets, trade, we need to come out, go out into the world and, and interact with the world and ideally win playing that game. And Jefferson's like, oh, no, no, that way lies ruin. Right, that's what's corrupted and corrupted Europe. We need to be self-sufficient yeoman farmers, and that's where our virtue will lie, mm. right? Mm-hmm. And that was the dialectic. And basically, Hamilton kicked Jefferson's ass, right? Mm-hmm. America never stood a chance. And then we went into like 1890s, you know, Civil War, blah blah blah, First World War, Second World War, and just we got sucked into it and then ran the table because everybody else blew each other to smithereens, right? And right. so, but like now, it's almost like we're in the upside down. And we've got two cancerous versions of the Hamiltonian and Jeffersonian dream. So you've got NAFTA, globalism, Walmart, multinationals with the rights of of citizens, all that kind of shit. And it's like, wait, there's no trickle-down economics. You know, the middle class is mm. gone. You know, you've got sweatshops. You know, everybody's living. I don't want all that cheap plastic shit that's mm. ending up in the ocean. So like globalism, we got the backwards-ass version of that. Mm. If we were sold a bill of goods, like it'll, be, it'll all work out for everyone. Well, it hasn't. You know, and you've got wealth disparities that outpace anything we've ever seen, and they're all slinking off the field. But the warped version of Jeffersonianism is the alt-right ethno-nationalism, right? They're like, close our borders. The world is dangerous, right? Our virtue lies in our skin, right? Mm -hmm. Blood and soil, right? right? So we've got these really, we've got these two cancerous versions of the actual original conversation around the American experiment. So can we dust those off and be like, hey... Jeffersonianism, back to the land, 
grow our own food, self-sufficiency, solar and wind power, right? Urban gardens, like there lies virtue, mm-hmm. right. there lies there lies strength and resilience. Like that's awesome. Yes. And also the global part of like, can we be a citizen of, can we be citizens of the world? Mm. Can we engage in the UN? I mean, I was just at Santos, was sitting next to this, was Sir, gosh, Michael Hart, I think. But he, and he was the former general of the SAS, badass, 75-year-old, wow. I mean, ramrod straight, twinkle in his eye <laughs> at this formal dinner, like string quartet playing all the, all the, you know, the officers in spurs and like crazy old jackets, like wow. ridiculous event. And he's telling the story of leading the UN <clears throat> in Bosnia and Bill Clinton like calling him and trying to get the inf- you know trying to get the info on like what's going on and he wouldn't take the call because he's like he's like we are so enmeshed in this and there's so much delicate like tribal trust and regional trust between all the things and he said and I said so what do you think I said do you feel like the UN's doing a good thing he's like oh my gosh they, we have saved so much bloodshed around the world because of the UN like the normal thing is to slag off the UN as a bunch of like gutless bureaucrats right right, right? It's such mm-hmm. an easy whipping man you're like oh my gosh like how many utterly powerless people in the last half century have had their lives and their homes saved because there is some watchdog over people trying to do the might makes right play mm-hmm. so can we back to the big infinite game and the and, you know in this ultimate experiment can we actually commit to realizing it's imperfect but celebrating the progress, not as a mansplaining, intersectional, white dude, slow your roll, you'll get your turn. You know, none of that. Like, acknowledge the urgency, acknowledge the anger, acknowledge the legacies, of all of it, but say, this is it. Our solution, we already have in our hands. We just have to not fumble the football. Mm. Don't burn it to the ground. Right? Yeah. I mean, look at, look at Rhodesia turned Zimbabwe, right? Mugabe did that. Right, and and they and they took over all the plantations. They chopped down all the orchards for firewood. They trashed the houses. They tanked their GDP. Jeez. And it's t- it's a you know it's a tin pot dictatorship now. Yeah. And you're like, so that's a that's a classic <laughs> definition of a pyrrhic victory. Right. You know, you win but you lose. Right. Yeah. So so basically, we all need to find a. Uh, um, Altered states of consciousness and get into a non narrative states of reality to have uh-huh. our transcendent experience to figure out exactly what role we could potentially play in all of that. And and defrag our nervous systems and release our every you know, our literally the deepest levels of trauma from ancestral to to biographic, so that we can show up with joy, love and creativity and generosity and resilience. Beautiful. Yeah. And we got some work to do. Ever and always. Yeah. Well, that was amazing. Um, Jamie, thank you so much for sitting down with us today. If anybody would like to find out more tools and techniques uh, in order to to get to that flow state, Stealing Fire is probably the best resource out there these days. It summarizes all of those things. So thank you for uh, co-authoring that and putting that together. Phenomenal book. I loved every part of it. Thanks, man. Um, Anything else you'd like to add today? No, if you want to check out other stuff, just flowgenomeproject.com. All right. Yeah. Cool, man. Thank you very much for coming on. Yeah, for sure, guys. All right. Anything from you? No, I'm good. I think we wrap it up. Uh, if you'd like to give floating a try, you can use the promo code Vancouver Real. That will save you 20% on a single float. Defrag your nervous system. Yep. And until right next there. time. To whatever it is.